Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for this webinar titled Helping Youth Know Their HIV Status. My name is Aisha Moore, and I am the Project Director of What Works in Youth HIV. Before we get started with the content, I want to go over a few housekeeping items. The audio is being shared via your computer, speakers, slash headset, and if you can't hear the audio, make sure your computer audio is turned on as people who can't hear me will see that on the slide. And if you're still having problems, please use the following call-in number that's also on the slide. So if you know of any colleagues who are having trouble, um, please let them know about these directions. Attendees are in listen-only mode. If you have questions for any of the presenters, please chat your questions throughout the presentation. We will answer all of the questions at the end, but we want to make sure that you ask your questions while you're thinking of them and don't forget them at the end. So now we're going to move on to our objectives. Our objectives today are to learn about the resources of the What Works in HIV Center, review HIV testing guidelines for adolescents, learn how to develop data-driven strategies for recruiting youth into HIV testing, and learn strategies to help keep youth engaged at the HIV testing site. So before we get to our speakers, I just wanted to let you know about our center. The What Works in Youth HIV project began about a year ago. We're going to be um, celebrating our first year on July 1, 2016. We are funded by the Department of Health and Human Services Secretary Minority AIDS Fund. And our goal is to advance best practices to improve the health and well-being of America's adolescents by providing innovative and practical content that makes youth-serving providers and peer leaders feel empowered to meet the needs of youth at highest risk for HIV. So what I want to stress in this goal is that we're looking for things that are innovative and practical. So what we, we've done over the um, first year is to really curate resources around topics on HIV prevention, youth sexual health, um, and youth, positive youth development. So we're really seeing ourselves as the bridge between those three um, items. So to talk a little bit about our purpose. Um, we, our purpose is really around evidence-based interventions and promising practices. So we are supporting and promoting interventions and strategies to better integrate HIV prevention services um, focused on adolescents. And because this is funded by the Minority AIDS Initiative, we, are focused, um, we have a focus on racial and ethnic minority populations that are um, most impacted by the HIV epidemic. And as I mentioned earlier, we're looking at evidence-based and evidence-informed programs and practices. So not just your um, standard CDC evidence-based practices, but other things like HIV testing, um, PrEP, and things of that nature. So not just the educational EBBs that are usually done in schools or community-based organizations. We're looking at other things. Um, and we're providing links to training. So if you have a training, let us know. And also technical assistance opportunities um, around social marketing, social media, and education campaigns, as well as the evidence-based practices. So now I will move on to introducing our four speakers. Our first speaker is Dr. Nicole Leiden, and she's a senior health scientist in the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention to the Division of Adolescent and School Health. In that division, she focuses on sexual and reproductive health services for youth. Dr. Ladon has previously published extensively on the human papilloma virus vaccine, acceptability among partners, providers, and adolescents. More recently, her research and work focuses on school health systems and HIV, STD, and pregnancy prevention. After Dr. Ladon, you will hear from two speakers from the um, National Alliance for State and Territory Territorial AIDS Directors. First up will be Justin Rush, who is a seasoned policy, public government affairs, and health equity professional, currently serving as a manager for policy and le legislative affairs at NASDAQ, spearheading the organization's state policy and legislative affairs efforts. In this role, Justin provides technical assistance on internal health department policy while simultaneously working to push the organization's policy positions through state agencies, legislatures, building strategic partnerships, nurturing external partnerships, and supporting existing HIV and hepatitis advocacy efforts within states and Congress. 
Justin is also a member of the Work, Works and Youth HIV Advisory Board. Along with Justin is Jillian Casey, and she's a senior manager on the NASDAQ prevention team. She manages capacity building and technical assistance activities to support HIV prevention programs and state HIV planning groups. Jillian has worked and volunteered in HIV prevention, care, and treatment domestically and abroad for the past 10 years, most recently directing a clinical HIV testing program in North Carolina before joining NASDAQ in 2011. Our final speaker you will hear from is Samantha Kwiatkowski. And Samantha is the Prevention and Training Consultant for the Florida Department of Health Area 4 AIDS program located in Jacksonville, Florida. She coordinates the implementation of HIV high impact prevention efforts in Northeast Florida, including the training of HIV testing counselors, planning of testing and outreach events, and local condom distribution. Additionally, she has assisted in the development and implementation of the Jacksonville Teen Health Centers, which you will hear about in this presentation. So now I will turn it over to Dr. Ladon of CDC to give us an overview um, of adolescent HIV testing guidelines. Um, thank you. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this webinar. Um, I'd like to quickly go over what my talk will focus on today. So if we could switch, go to the next slide, please. First, I'll review some of the surveillance data we have on HIV among youth in the U.S., including some of the behaviors that put youth at risk in particular. I'll then talk about some of the official government and professional organization guidelines about testing youth for HIV, and then review some of the real challenges for HIV prevention, including getting uh, these guidelines enacted um, that are particular to young people. And then uh, we'll conclude uh, about what you as providers can do to address some of those challenges. So next slide, please. Um, so recent HIV surveillance data has been, just been released from 2014 and um, show, continues to show what we've been seeing for several years. That is, about 20% of new HIV infections are among young people ages 13 to 24 years. African Americans account for more than half of the new HIV infections in that age group. And also, new infections are primarily among males, and usually this comes from male-to-male -male contact. So I will point out um, also this last point that a majority, or more than 80% of new HIV infections among that 13 to 24 year age group occurred among persons ages uh, 20 to 24. So that is, it's really concentrated in that slightly older, um, older end of the range. Next slide. So when looking at adolescents pretty broadly, the Youth Risk Behavior Surveillance System out of the CDC recently released data, and I think it was just released last week, I believe, um, that shows almost half of high school students report having had sex, and 43.1% of sexually active students did not use a condom the last time they had sex. Only 1 in 10 of all students have ever been tested for HIV, so I think that's really what we'll be focusing on here today. As well, adolescents have high rates of STDs, and STDs um, increase the risk of HIV. Uh, for instance, although they account for only a quarter of the U.S. population, 15 to 24-year-olds account for half of the 20, 20 million new STD cases each year. Next slide. Thank you. So before I get into the HIV testing guidelines, I, I want to point out that when we talk about increasing access to testing and getting youth tested for HIV in particular, we're only talking about one aspect of the process to manage HIV, both for the individual who might be infected, but also at a population level in terms of public health prevention. So there are also issues with youth in terms of linkage to and retention and care once they've been diagnosed. So these statistics illustrate some of the problems or issues we have with HIV among youth at each stage of that continuum. For instance, uh, on the far left, you see that 18 to 24-year-olds have the highest rate of undiagnosed HIV of any age group. Further, they have the lowest rate of linkage to care, and only about half of those that are linked to care are retained in care one year later. Next slide. So while all of these are public health concerns and deserve the attention, um, and a lot of you may, may address um, 
that work in aspects of your work. Today we're going to focus on how we may address the issue of diagnosing those young people infected with HIV and also better yet preventing youth from ever getting infected. Next slide. So we'll start with some of the HIV testing guidelines. Um, the United States Preventive Services Task Force, or USPSTF, recommends um, reviews and ranks existing clinic-based evidence, recommends that clinicians screen for HIV infection in adolescents and adults between the ages of 15 and 65. Further, they state that younger adolescents and older adults um, at increased risk should also be screened. Uh, so I should say that this received an A ranking for the USPSTF, which means that there's a high certainty that this, is, uh, that this clinical preventive service will be beneficial and is the highest ranking that any clinical service can, can receive. It should be noted that this guideline is rather broad, as you can see, and leaves um, relatively open to interpretation um, how often to screen individuals or at what intervals. Um, it is also rather open to interpretations of, of what we mean by at risk or at increased risk. risk. Next slide. So the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention similarly recommend routine screening for HIV infection for all clinical patients ages 13 to 64. In this case, routine refers to the setting and not necessarily the time interval. Uh, that is, it means it should be a routine practice in very, various types of clinical settings. They further suggest at least one test in a lifetime and further say that high-risk patients should be screened, quote, more often. This specifically is defined as um, HIV testing at the time that a young person presents for either STD or pregnancy test, and at least annually, annual testing for those um, at increased risk, defined by things like being an injection drug user, exchanging sex for money, having more than one partner since the last HIV test, and being a, a man who has sex with men. Next slide. So some providers we've talked to and that we work with here in um, the Division of Adolescent School Health at CDC find the rather um, detailed HIV testing guidelines published by the um, AAP in 2011 are rather helpful and choose to follow these in their practice. So this publication listed at the bottom of the slide provides a lot of recommendations. I, I'm not sure the exact number, but I'm just highlighting three um, here in this slide. Uh, because they relate specifically to clinical interpretation of, um, of, of testing. So the first one addresses all adolescents, regardless of sexual activity, and suggests that anyone living in a high prevalence area, and that's defined as a, as a rate greater than 0.1%, should be offered an HIV test by 16 to 18 years of age. The second suggests that regardless of geographic prevalence, any sexually active adolescents or those with substance use or other risk factors be routinely screened for HIV. And then third, um, similar to what's suggested by the CDC, um, they say that annual testing should be given to high-risk youth. So adolescents in particular undergoing testing for STI should be tested at the time of presentation. So just to review real quickly, the first one is that any adolescents, regardless of sexual activity, that live in a high prevalence area should be tested between 16 to 18. The second one is that all sexually active um, adolescents or, and those with substance use should, be, um, should have routine testing offered. And the third is that um, high-risk youth presenting for STIs in particular should be uh, offered at HIV test at the same visit. So next slide. So now uh, that we understand the testing guidelines, let's turn attention to some of the challenges we face in preventing HIV among youth. So many of you work in the fields and have experienced these um, and probably other challenges firsthand. So this isn't an exhaustive list, but rather a simple one to illustrate the point of various challenges that we face. First, young people um, face challenges to access to services. I focus here in my presentation a bit on the barriers to getting a teen tested for HIV once they're in a clinical setting, but it would be really short-sighted for us not to acknowledge that it's often trouble getting a teen into the service itself. Um, I believe some of the other speakers here today may focus on this particular aspect. Next slide. Um, <clears throat> 
So, but of these potential challenges, I'm going to focus my next few slides just going a little bit deeper into the last two challenges listed here um, because they relate really to the work that we do here in DASH and at CDC. I could highlight that work for you. Next slide. So confidentiality is one of the most important issues regarding receipt of sexual and reproductive health care for young people. Um, in many states, they actually have uh, adolescents have the right to self-consent for these services without their parents' knowledge at younger ages than 18. But many young people, parents, and providers themselves are simply unaware of those state laws. Um, so um, we need to increase the parental um, uh, consent requirements or the perceptions of just marketing those, uh, make, making people more aware of them. Particular to the work that we do here at DASH, because we work a lot with school um, people who provide school-based services, is some confusion about um, HIPAA and FERPA privacy laws. Um, so this is particular to those providing services in school where school nurses or other staff are employed by the education system. And so um, according to the Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act, or FERPA, um, which this grants parents the right to review any information that's in a school record, um, if, if a nurse is employed by an education agency, then technically uh, that school record and things like referring for an HIV or STD test by a school nurse would be covered by FERPA, and therefore there's the potential for um, parental review of that record. So that directly contradicts the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, which would prohibit covered entities from disclosing um, public uh, protected health information to any third party. So you can see that we're dealing here with, um, at DASH and with, with drawing some distinction between these. Additionally, expanded insurance coverage of young people on their parents' insurance up to age 26 that was granted by the ACA has also had the um, somewhat unintended consequence of magnifying issues how explanation of benefits or EOBs for ins insured services um, often sent to parents and can inadvertently break confidentiality confidentiality of young people who seek certain services. Uh, and finally, um, other issues include provider competency in general um, and uh, in general settings and the need for teen-friendly services, the unique transportation needs of young people, um, the competency of staff and institutions, uh, at least for us at DASH, to refer from schools to community-based providers. And this is something we're addressing um, in our current funding cycle to 15 local education agencies and 16 state education agencies. So next slide. Now we turn to some of the barriers uh, created by uh, perceptions of risk. In terms of perceptions of risk, this may be explained by really a lack of knowledge about HIV or how it's spread, its prevalence, and then ways to prevent it. So one way that we at DASH suggest improving this is via um, comprehensive sexual health education. And there is definitely room for improvement in regard to this, as you can see from some of our surveillance data from the 2014 School Health Profiles. Uh, Profiles is a system, that we, uh, system of surveys we use here at DASH to assess school health policies and practices in states and um, large urban school districts. You can see some of the shortcomings here. Next slide. So also in terms of perception of risk, um, here's a very recent, as a matter of fact, a colleague of mine and I just ran this for this webinar. Um, it's a very simple analysis of the National Survey Family Growth data from 2011-2013 and lists um, the reasons that 15 to 19 year olds give for not getting an HIV test. So as you can see, the most cited reasons are unlikely exposed to HIV at 71% and never offered an HIV test at 22%. Um, real quickly, it should be noted that these are among 15 and 19 year olds that have never been tested for HIV. Um, and um, also, this particular analysis was run on all um, 15 and 19 year olds regardless of sexual activity. So it might include some that have never had sex. And so they might actually accurately perceive that their risk is low and that they're unlikely exposed to HIV. Uh, we, we looked at that sample really merely for sample size because it was larger for the 15 and 19 year olds. But when we did look at these same reasons, only looking at sexually active young people 15 and 19, these percentages really didn't change. It was still 
of kids who had had sex or were having sex said they'd not likely exposed, and it was about 25% that said they'd never been offered an HIV test. So some of these perceptions of risk might be um, from the adolescent or young person themselves, but also from providers who are, are not recommending HIV testing. Next slide. Okay, so we obviously need to be offering HIV tests more to young people, and we need to work to provide them with an accurate assessment of their own risk. But I'm going to conclude with a few other things that providers can do when offering HIV testing to youth. Um, and some of these are those other recommendations suggested by the, A the AAP in a 2011 position statement um, that's in pediatrics. First, they can work to increase youth access to services. That is, they can um, recruit them through the door by working with partners to create systems of referrals, directly uh, working with young people to increase their awareness of the availability of confidential services, or work with parents to get them to grant time alone with a provider for their teen or um, son the teen son or daughter. Um, once in the door of the clinic or other provider, they can follow the current HIV testing and treatment guidelines. They can also routinely assess sexual and substance abuse behaviors, um, preferably with a standardized assessment tool. They can counsel their young patients about HIV and, and also really STD risk and prevention strategies, especially those that test negative for HIV or, or who have not yet had sex. And they can provide HIV prevention services specifically tailored for youth. Um, and I suspect that some of you actually specialize in this already. Um, providers should also do things to protect comp uh, patient confidentiality and then really foster a positive um, environment that allows young people to feel free to discuss sex as well as their gender and sexual orientation. So next slide is really just the conclusion. Thank you for your time and attention today. If you need any um, additional information, feel free to contact me at that number. Uh, and please visit our DASH webpage to find out more about our work to encourage HIV, STD, and teen pregnancy prevention among youth. Thank you very much, Dr. Ladon. Um, that was a very interesting presentation. It was great to be able to get information hot off the presses that just came out last week. So now I'd like to introduce, introduce Justin Rush, the policy manager, policy and legislative affairs manager at NASDAQ, and Jillian Casey, who is senior manager on the prevention team. Um, as I just mentioned, they both work on staff at the National Alliance of State and Territorial AIDS Directors. Justin and Jillian, you may begin. Hello, everyone. Um, this is Justin Rush from NASDAQ. I guess I will be kicking this off. <clears throat> We're going to be doing a little bit of talking about uh, what we can be will be as a group and can be doing to help youth know their HIV status. Um, next slide, please. So just to give a little bit of background information about NASA, we are the National Alliance of State and Territorial AIDS Directors. We were established in 1992 as the voice of state AIDS directors. Um, we represent AIDS directors within, and their staff within the 50 states and six U.S. territories. Um, and we're governed by uh, a board and we have offices in Washington, D.C., and across the globe. So <clears throat> that's just a little bit of a background about who we are. I will say that one of the great things and, um, and opportunities that we have is to be able to reach out to AIDS directors within their states and to figure out what it is that they're doing and to call some of the best practices and successes across the country, more specifically as it applies to um, youth engagement around HIV testing. So a lot of what we're going to be talking about today on my end is some, some programs that are working that have had some success. Um, and we found a lot of these programs just by doing a lot of just uh, call-in and check-ins with our, 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 our members. But at the same time, we have a Center for Engaging Black Women Across the Care Continuum, which is our cooperative agreement with HRSA. And a lot of what we've been doing with that project is creating, um, well, is identifying care models um, and then packaging them in a way to be able to disseminate the information to other people to see if they are scalable, other organizations, um, and working to develop those care models. So some of what I'm going to discuss in just a second is going to is a re direct result of that work that we've been doing to create care models at NASDAQ. So the next slide, please. <clears throat> so this is just a, a figure. Uh, Thirty-six percent of teens live online for health topics that are hard to talk about, like drug use, sexual health, or depression. 
Um, I think that this is, if we were all to be honest with ourselves and look down right now, probably our cell phones are in our hands, and I think that that's the same for, for youth. They go online for most of all of their information. Google is their friend. Um, they're using apps to engage, and everything that they need to know is at, is at the, the tip of their fingertips. So when we're thinking about a lot of the successful programs that I'm going to be discussing, um, and I know that the, the previous speaker just touched on this briefly beforehand, but youth and social media usage and engagement via, via new media is something that is very important um, in today's time and also is something that can, can maximize one's HIV testing and at engagement the results and the concerns trying to make sure that more youth are tested. Next slide, please. <clears throat> So it's just kind of a, a little bit of a of what's working and an idea to provide a pulse of what some health departments are doing in regards to youth engagement and testing. Um, our Virginia Health Department is what we would like to consider one of our rock stars. So when it concerns black gay men or other uh, key populations, and specifically when it comes to youth, they are getting ready to kickstart a program um, off called in-home testing program for youth in Virginia. So it's going to be leveraging social media campaigns to target high-risk MSN populations for free in-home HIV testing kits. So they're going to be doing a lot of advertising for the kits online. So in the spaces and places where a lot of the, the, the age group of 13 to 24 are, are going online to either at meet up to have sex or to meet up to, to create or find community. So this includes Grindr, Jack, Scruff, BGC Live and Adam for Adam. As a note, during our Game and Health Equity meeting a couple of months ago, the, when they were talking about this, the implementation of this program, the Virginia Health Department stated that out of all the mediums that they used for outreach for this, pro for this project or for other projects out, outside of Grindr, Jack, Scruff, BGC Live, and Adam for Adam, the place that they had the most success with in getting the most clicks was actually Pandora. So it was, it, you know, so it's not a, a medium that most people would think about in regards to reaching out to for HIV testing or putting an ad um, for more information about HIV testing. But it's these non-traditional avenues and these non-traditional partnerships that are that are meaning great results in the concerns of HIV testing, uh, specifically as it pertains to youth. Um, and users will be able to complete an online consent form, a risk assessment survey, and an order form for free for free in-home HIV test kits. And usually when we talk about this, people start to have questions about the mental health implications of, of this project. So what if someone it does a test at home and then they actually get a positive result? And what do they do then? And I think that these are, these are things that the, the group in Virginia is hoping to work out. They also are providing resources and wraparound services or contact information and building relationships with mental health providers within the region to be able to ensure that there is an infrastructure in place to ensure that those who do test, test positive or those that just have questions around what their HIV test means, that they can reach out to the Virginia Health Department and they can also reach out to uh, local mental health providers within that state. So this is just an example of something, an in-home testing program specifically designed for you, you that is utilizing new media apps and social media um, platforms to be able to provide online consent forms and do a risk assessment survey and ultimately hopefully get more um, youth tested for HIV. So more information we definitely provide about that at the end or I could definitely make a um, connection between an individual who's interested in the part, hearing more about the project and the Virginia Health Department. Next slide, please. Um, and this is just goes back to current and future efforts. And so this is, and again, this is picking up and, and piggybacking on what was previously stated by the, the, form, the, the first presenter. Um, you know, people refer to these populations as hard to reach all the time, but I think that a lot of times, and this is something that one of our members said from Iowa, it's not necessarily that they're hard to reach, it's that our services are, are hard to reach. So innovation is key. Um, and you always have to be willing to reevaluate your community leaders. You always need to be able to have a cadre of gatekeepers, individuals within your jurisdiction that are knowledgeable of the lay of the land, where youth are going to engage in community, where they're going to go party, um, where they are convening, um, and you need to be able to have, be nimble enough to engage your stakeholders um, and identify and utilize those stakeholders to, to figure out what it is that you can do, what are the constraints of the work that you can be doing, and you also need to be working with those individuals that are well-heeled within the community to be able to support new leadership and support the things that they're doing. 
So it's more of a collaborative partnership. And I think that in the in the the programs that I'm discussing, that's definitely the a major must piece is that innovation is key and supporting new leadership and um and and reaching out to community leaders is definitely very important when you're trying to increase HIV testing for youth. Next slide please. <clears throat> so can the next program that I'm going to discuss is called Connect to Protect. It's partnerships for youth prevention interventions. I'm sure some of you all are familiar with Connect to Protect, but it was initiated in 2002 and it's been implemented in 14 urban communities um, as of 2016. And the main goal is to reduce HIV incidence and prevalence among youth ages 20, I'm sorry, ages 12 to 24, all through community mobilization and structural changes. So this goes back again to engaging the community. So one thing that we've definitely been advising at my time here is that if you are trying to reach out to key populations, if you are trying to engage in meaningful community engagement, then you need to have a cadre, even if it's five to ten people, of individuals that are representative of the people that you're trying to engage um, as a resource. So some people call these a community advisory boards, whatever you would like to refer to them as. But Connect to Protect um, operates very well because it's a community mobilization initiative. It's focused on the local community. It's a coalition of individuals coming to the, together to determine what the key structural barriers and challenges are and what is the best way that the coalition can address those as a community locally. Um, so there's a central administrative body, but for the most part, the C2P within local jurisdictions acts as a, an arm of, of the broader Connect to Protect coalition. Um, and they also provide TA and ongoing feedback on the, the activities of the coalition and, and provide next steps and, and, and uh, capacity in regards to the community mobilization efforts that the, uh, the partnership decides to undertake. Next slide, please. So just a little bit of more information um, about C2P Memphis, and we chose this jurisdiction because um, because of the HIV incident rates within um, the state of Tennessee, also the the traditionally hard time that the health department and CDLs have had in engaging um, youth ages 13 to 24 within these jurisdictions. Um, and again, the goal and the vision is to reduce new HIV infections in Memphis. Memphis is most vulnerable youth. So next slide, please. So again, it's all about a collaborative approach. Um, if you are trying to, again, engage a group of individuals, the first question is, is, is there institutional consistency? So is what we're trying to do, are, is it informed by the people that we're trying to do it on behalf of or that we're trying to do it with? I think that we have to get out of this, this space of mind that you can advocate for people without including them in the process. And I think that a lot of HIV testing for youth has to do with, one, arming them with the issues that are most important, so it's the education. But then, two, you also need to provide them the tools necessary for them to be able to advocate for themselves so that when they go into a healthcare delivery system, they have the tools necessary to be able to, to articulate what's going on with them from a sexual, uh, sexual history perspective and to be able to, to deal with the power dynamics that are at play when a youth, sometimes of color, may come into a doctor's office. And so we want to be able to make sure that they are armed with the information necessary to be able to navigate the healthcare delivery system. So that takes a collaborative approach and that takes coalition partners. So all of the power brokers, community stakeholders, health departments, decision makers, content experts, much like if you were going to try to implement a statewide ready to end AIDS campaign, you would first have to start off with community. Community is the, the word of the day in regards to my presentation because it really is going to take a community mobilization initiative and effort across the country to be able to, one, educate youth with, it, with the tools necessary to be able to navigate the healthcare delivery system, two, know their status, and three, for them to be able to advocate for their, themselves and their health. Next slide, please. So this is again a little bit more information about um, the types of work that Connect to Protect is doing. Um, so they're doing one-on-one -on -one counseling, they're educating adolescents, um, and on a community level they're, they're looking at local systems and practices, they're looking at the context of the local epidemic, they're engaging community members, and they have a diverse stakeholder involvement in all of these processes. 
Uh, at a structural, le structural level, they're looking at policies, practices, laws, and systems that may be impacting youth's ability to be able to gain access to HIV testing. I know one thing that we're working on here for year three of our Center for Engaging Black Women Across the Care Continuum is that one barrier in a lot of states is ID access. So we, want to, we say that we want to get more people tested and we want to get more youth tested. But if they have been kicked out of their home and they are, don't currently have a, a, a supportive system in their state or where they're from, if they're trying to gain access to services and gaining access to services requires a government issued ID, if they have to then go back to the home to where they were displaced from to get consent just to gain access to a government issued ID just so they can gain access to services, that's a problem. So that would be a policy or a law or a system that's currently in place on a structural level, level, lack of ID access and requiring parental consent to gain access to an ID would be a structural level barrier. Um, and that would be something that they would evaluate within the C2P collaboration. And I know some of them are actually doing some of that work across the country in some of the local C2P jurisdictions. And then they're also looking at the, the social determinants of health that we call it. So racism, poverty, homophobia, truly believe as an organization that if you're not having a multi-pronged conversation about racism, poverty, homophobia, policies that start serve as a barrier, local systems and practices, then you need to be having those conversations and you need to be having those conversations with members of a co broader coalition that's representative of the people that you're trying to reach out to and that is individuals that are 13 to 24, specifically those that are of color. Next slide, please. Um, and this is just a little bit more information about CCP Memphis. This is a southern state uh, Republican legislature, a very, uh, very difficult political climate, um, dealing with a lot of lack of HIV literacy and stigma as it pertains to HIV testing. But they have uh, done, so far, 398 community actions since 2008, 95 participants. Um, and they have had a lot of policy change um, 52 SEO, so we're thinking about program policy practices changes that have been implemented as a result of the CTP Memphis. Next slide, please. And again, to highlight another program um, from a southern state, because oftentimes I feel like where the incidence is and the barriers as it pertains to gaining access to care for youth within southern states is very difficult and it's, and it's, it's very situational to the jurisdiction. Um, but Smile Memphis was launched in 2010, and again, the goal is to, to test more um, youth ages 13 to 24. And really what it, this does is it's all about case manager adolescent outreach. So they have an outreach expert, and they provide linkage to and retention and care services for HIV positive adolescents and young adults referred to the program by the testing location. So this gets back to wraparound services and making sure that we're building relationships Within the, within the HIV uh, public health community to be able to ensure that if, if there's a need that you have, that if we are not able to provide it, that we can immediately link them to, um, to an individual who can and retain them into care. Next slide, please. <clears throat> and this is just a little bit of data around SMILE uh, Memphis, a total number of cases referred so 655, average number of referrals per month, percentage of cases linked to care. Um, and again, they are receiving referrals from the testing site. So it's just kind of like a, a, a nice tag team situation where individuals are being tested. And then SMILE has, through a lot of their research and inventory, is able to, to immediately link them to care. And so next slide, please. So again, just want to kind of like pick up from the lessons learned um, is that Local HIV prevention planning councils are very important as seen in evidence through CCP. Um, pooling or sharing of resource assets is a strong facilitator, so we want to definitely break down silos within the community, um, and we want to build strong partnerships because we can then lean on those partnerships to help identify gatekeepers and to figure out what the pulse of youth nightlife or, or youth activity is within the jurisdiction. Coalition, community coalition members is very important. Um, and then shifting the HIV epidemic um, requires cultivating community relationships and it will take time. So recognizing that you, Rome wasn't built in a day, that 
that a lot of this is stuff that will take work that will take some time. But by working in community and building coalitions, that this work can be achieved together. Um, and we have to be new and we have to be innovative in our, in, in our approaches. So with that said, I am going to um, give it over to my colleague, Jillian Casey, and she's going to talk about the, our HIV testing toolkit. Thanks, Justin. I'm going to take us back to a bit of a more of a 30,000 foot level for a minute here. Um, Justin's given a lot of great examples from different jurisdictions that are really working on the ground with community. And I'm going to take it back to sort of the very first questions that need to be considered in starting to identify not just that youth are your focus population, but um, you know, exactly what age, youth who hang out where, uh, youth who have what different risk factors. And so we in SSAT are one of three, um, I'm sorry, we are one of uh, eight providers who are funded to do capacity building assistance for um, health departments. I'm sorry, I'm pointing to Justin to change slide, and I realize I need to ask for next slide. <laughs> next slide, please. So we are funded um, by the Centers for Disease Control, specifically in the area of HIV testing. And through those funds, we've developed a series of toolkits over the past year, the first of which um, was on um, selecting a testing strategy. The second was on uh, productivity and yield analysis and looking at how well the testing that you're doing is actually working. Are you finding people who are positive? Do you need to change your strategy? And then most recently, this past spring, we just released a uh, third toolkit on data-driven targeting and recruitment. And each of these are available on our website. I've hyperlinked them here. They also have um, fillable worksheets, Excel files, and templates for using to help guide your work. The audience for these primarily starts out as health departments. However, particularly in this data-driven targeting and recruitment, it's really a dual audience as we recognize a lot of the data work would be done by the health department in identifying where they're going to distribute resources. And then a lot of the recruitment is going to be done on the ground by partners and community-based organizations. So next slide, please. So just to give some definitions, for, for these purposes when we talk about targeting, we're referring to the use of data to focus program efforts on the right populations in the right setting to maximize identification of undiagnosed HIV infection. So we'll talk about focus populations. As, uh, as those that we are targeting our resources to to reach them with HIV testing. Next slide, please. And recruitment, in this sense, then refers to the strategies that one would use, such as promotion methods, um, locating your services, the types of services, the types of messaging and messengers that you're using in order to engage members of the focus populations in HIV testing. And next slide. And then further in this toolkit, we talk a lot about segmentation, which is really a marketing term. But in this context for planning your HIV testing services, we're referring to dividing a population into subgroups that are similar in specific ways related to their HIV risk. So we can then determine sort of the highest risk, moderate risk, low risk. We can really focus where we need to be reaching people by further segmenting our focus population. Next slide. And the way that we, that we conduct segmentation or that the health department might conduct segmentation is really by using all data sources that are available to them. And so you'd be looking at things like what health services are available, um, the prevalence and incidence of both HIV, STDs, Hep C, looking at HIV risk behaviors, looking at any local evaluations or local data needs assessments that have been done. You really want to consider different individual characteristics that put folks at use. So in this case, if we're, excuse me, put youth at risk if we're talking about youth in this case. You also want to think about um, just behaviors and situational or environmental factors as well as social factors. Next slide, please. So at this first high level, before talking about what resources you might have in your jurisdiction to conduct your own data collection. There's a lot that's available nationally. So I think most people might be familiar with the National HIV Behavioral Surveillance System, um, the Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance System, the BRFS, the Youth Risk Behavioral Surveillance System, YRBS, as well as several others focused on drug use and health, on, on treatment, on substance abuse treatment services. Um, all of these would be available without yet needing to plug in additional resources 
to mine data locally. Next slide. Um, so with those and with the local data that are available to you, looking at the situations in your jurisdiction that put youth at risk, you now want to think about what are the strategies we can use to engage youth and to meet their needs. And so CEC has defined six different recruitment strategies. Those are street-based, internet-based, um, internet referrals, external referrals, social networking, and social marketing. And the things to think about here in determining how can we reach youth, you need to ask the question, where should we be reaching them and when? Uh, what methods are they going to be most responsive to? Justin was talking earlier about the surprising findings in Virginia that Pandora was actually the most effective in getting people to click through for more information about HIV testing. So thinking about the different platforms beyond those that we've been using in the past. Um, who should be conducting the recruitment? What messages will be most effective? And how can you tailor those messages further to really meet those specific segmented focus populations? Next slide, please. Um, so when asking yourself those questions, I'm going to review some additional resources, but think about things like, um, so when you're asking who is at risk for HIV transmission, if you're talking about youth and you're talking about youth in a specific area, a specific zip code, what is it that might then be placing them at risk? What are the behaviors that are occurring? Um, what other factors might influence risk? So what lack of access to treatment or to condoms or to testing? Um, then you need to be thinking about where does this particular group that I'm trying to reach live? Where does this group socialize? Um, where do they meet for, for sex or for other risk behaviors? Um, what about any sort of drug sharing, needle sharing? Where do they get their health information? And what issues or factors that could be barriers to HIV testing need to be addressed? So these are the kinds of things that in the toolkit we actually talk through in more detail. Um, we also have some case studies and examples, but really trying to help those community-based organizations that are conducting the recruitment to hone their practices to really be able to reach a very specific population rather than this kind of blanketed approach that we've often taken with the HIV testing in terms of non-clinical settings where anybody who comes to our services is getting a test. Um, that's great, but how can we also make sure that we're finding those people who most need it and may not have access otherwise without our services? So other resources in addition to these toolkits that I've been mentioning, I think I actually have the old picture up here. CDC this past spring did release updated guidelines for testing in non-clinical settings. Um, Preceding that, they actually contracted with ICF Macro and we partnered with ICF Macro on the development of two toolkits. One is really a program manager's guide for implementing testing in non-clinical settings, and the second is an evaluation guide. And so those are also available on effectiveinterventions.org and would be great resources in looking at different outreach methods that you could use to reach youth. Um, and that is it. I think we We'll be turning it back over to JSI. Thanks so much. Uh, if you have any questions, next slide. Our contact information should be available. Yep. Thank you again. Thank you very much for that presentation. Um, some good stuff about knowing how to target people and really letting everyone know that it's possible to get this done with the examples that we saw that Justin that you provided. So now I'd like to introduce Samantha Kwiwakowski. She's a prevention and training consultant for the Florida Department of Health Area 4-H program located in Jacksonville. Samantha, you may begin. Thank you. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about how we can increase HIV testing amongst youth through the use of team-friendly health centers and the model that we currently have in place here in Jacksonville in Florida. Next slide. So my aim today are to help participants understand how they can translate this model or parts of this model into their own practices in order to increase HIV as well as STI testing amongst youth. And hopefully by the end of this webinar and um, my presentation, the participants will be able to see some of the barriers that we've come across um, while implementing the Teen Family Health Center and how we overcame those barriers. Next slide. So the teen health uh, centers are 
uh, a result of this partnership um, called the JPPHEA, which stands for the Jacksonville Partnership for Promoting Health for Emerging Adults. And it's federally funded through a DASH grant. Um, the Duval County Public School System, the school district in Duval County, received this grant. But it also incorporates the work of the health department, um, full service schools uh, through United Way, and JASM, which is the Jacksonville Area Sexual Minority Youth Network. This partnership focuses on disseminating the YRBS and the school health profile surveys, as well as training health educators to implement evidence-based sexuality education curricula. Um, the two that are going on right now in Duval County are Draw the Line, Respect the Line, and Reducing the Risk. So part of that work that I work on is the Teen Family Health Center, um, which at the health department we implement those, and Jasmine also assists in the implementation of the health centers. Next slide. So just a little bit about what's going on with Jacksonville youth um, in terms of HIV and their sexual health outcomes. According to the results of the 2015 Duval County VIRBS, which just came out about a month ago, we just received those, so it's really updated information. Um, about 37% of high school students in Duval County have ever had sex. 26% of them are currently sexually active. Of those sexually active students, about 40% didn't use a condom at last intercourse. And about 76% of high school students report ever having learned about HIV and AIDS in school, which is lower than the national average. Next slide. And what Florida charts, charts data indicates, and um, Florida charts is um, the Community Health Assessment Resource Tool Set, which is basically a surveillance system um, through the health departments here in Florida. But what they, what they show us is that Duval County in Florida is ranked first amongst the large counties for STDs amongst 15 to 19 year olds. So if we look at this chart um, in the middle of your screen, you'll see that Duval County has higher rates than other counties in Florida, but also um, as, as for the United States as a whole, Duval County is ranking higher. Additionally, we have higher rates of HIV in Duval. Um, we have about 31 cases per 100,000 people compared to the national rate of 23.6 cases, uh, rather the state rate, my apologies. Um, so on to the model, how the Jacksonville Teen Health Centers actually uh, happen, how they work, how we implement them. What we follow are the CDC guidelines for teen-friendly reproductive health visits. Um, so we address all aspects of confidentiality, privacy, consent, etc. So basically we ensure that teens are regularly made aware of their rights to confidential reproductive health services, um, the fact that they don't need parent permission in order to obtain an HIV test. And we never share any information with schools or parents. Um, their privacy is also maintained at these teen health centers through separate HIV and STI counseling and screening spaces. Um, so they're, they're definitely afforded privacy at our teen health center separate from the other participants there. The staff at the teen health centers are culturally competent when it comes to the needs of teens. Um, all of our staff are experienced um, in working with teens and reproductive health services, providing those services for teens. But we also, we, we do like to note that when we're providing these services and education to teens, we encourage them to speak to their parents or guardians about their needs when it's appropriate. We don't tell them to, you know, shut those people out or you can get these services without talking to them. We encourage them to talk to them. Next slide. So the services that we provide at our teen health centers include HIV and STI testing, pregnancy testing, we provide comprehensive sexuality education. Uh, we distribute condoms there. Um, we provide STI treatment as necessary. We provide individual counseling and, of course, referrals for uh, services that we can't provide. Right now, there are about five. There are five locations in Jacksonville, but we're expecting to open up uh, about three more over the course of the next year. That's our goal to have eight by the end of 2017. Uh, this doesn't count the Jasmine Clinic, which is uh, in addition to the teen health centers that are school-based. And the selection of these sites was actually determined through the use of geographic information systems mapping of STD cases. 
basically what we identified in Jacksonville where there are clusters of STDs and HIV and decided that those high schools nearest to those clusters would be the best locations to open teen health centers at. Next slide. So this is uh, the flyer that we use, and just in terms of um, our practice for marketing, so this flyer is what we use to recruit teens on the day of the teen health centers. So like I mentioned, we have five sites, and those sites are opened every other week. Um, so we have 10 open sites a month. That makes sense. Um, so we use these flyers right when we get there that day. We go out, we recruit from youth as they're dismissed by school. Um, we encourage them to come. We say that we're here. We explain what our services are, and we hand out these flyers. We also have school announcements that occur on the days of the Teen Health Center at each school site, um, and banners and signs around the school campus, including posters that hang up in visible locations for youth where they can see the next time that we're going to be there and the services that we provide. Next slide, please. So what does the visit to the Teen Health Center look like? So when youth arrive, they complete an intake form with one of the staff members. We have about five to six staff members um, each day of Teen Health Center, and each staff member has a designated role. So we have somebody specifically for intake, somebody specifically for testing, for education, et cetera. So when they get there, they complete this intake form with the intake staff member, and they let that staff member know what services they're there for that day, whether it's the health education, just there to get some condoms, if they need to get tested for an uh, HIV or STI or pregnancy. Um, and then after they let that staff member know what they need, there's another staff member, and they're like a flow person, and they escort that youth uh, to the appropriate location at our center. Typically, that's either the group education area or a private HIV STI counseling area. The HIV and STI screening, if the youth is there to have that done, takes about 15 minutes, sometimes longer, and involves counseling. I'll talk more about how we do HIV in a few slides now. Um, and the group health education sessions, where we do comprehensive sexuality education, those occur about every 15 to 20 minutes. And that really, the length of time that we do that education for, it depends on how many youth that we have there that day. So if we have youth waiting to come into an education session, we keep it to the 15, 20 minute mark. If we don't have youth waiting for the next session, then we kind of just keep going until we see that you know, the youth got what we, the message that we were sending and don't have additional questions. Um, next slide. So flexibility has definitely been the key to our success. So like I mentioned, these teen health centers are open, each site is open every other week during the school year. And basically when, when we're there, it's really impossible to predict how many youth we're going to take. So one of the things that makes these teen health centers really youth friendly is the fact that the youth don't need an appointment to go. Um, they kind of just show up, which is really great, but you know, then we can't really have an idea of how many we can expect to see. So we have to be flexible with that. Um, and then we found out, not surprisingly, that some of the HIV and STI counseling sessions are a little bit more complex than others. Some youth have much higher risk than other youth have, and therefore we have to work a little bit longer with them to, so that they can understand their risks and how to protect themselves. Um, we've also seen that the access to the space where we do group education or where we do testing has been affected by some unforeseen circumstances that we didn't know were going to occur until we got there. Um, for instance, the health education room at one of our sites about a month ago, they were, they were painting there. So we couldn't use the health education room that we were used to using. We had to figure out a different space. We had to be flexible with that. Additionally, the school schedule influences when we're at sites. So when a site is supposed to be open on an early release day, and we normally get there when the school day ends, say at you know, 1.30, 2 o'clock, if it's an early release day, then we have to be flexible with our schedule and come instead at like 11.30, 12 o'clock. Next slide. So specific to the HIV testing that we do, um, all of our HIV testing counselors are Department of Health staff 
And they've all received 24 hours of counselor training and also completed post requisites, uh, which involves being observed by experienced counselors um, and going through uh, different settings and role plays. The counseling session itself involves the HIV risk assessment portion, but also the development of a personalized HIV prevention plan. So after the youth receives HIV testing, they're walking out not just wondering what their result is going to be, but they also have knowledge of ways that they can protect themselves from getting HIV. Um, initially, we were using Clearview Rapid HIV antibodies testing, and that was a finger stick test, and we had results within 15 minutes. We ended up switching to the Orashore oral fluid test, and the reason for that was because it's cheaper, which, you know, we all know that's important. Um, there was no blood, so it's less invasive, and you know, youth that were saying that they didn't want to get tested because they didn't want to have to deal with the finger stick, they didn't want, they, you know, were worried about the blood piece of it or pain, um, that takes that barrier away. And finally, and I think probably most important is that if a youth does present with a positive result, a reactive result, then we have time to develop a game plan because rather than being rapid, when we get that result a couple of days later, we can figure out the best way to um, let that youth know their positive status rather than being same day on school grounds when they might have friends there. So Orisher has definitely been um, a better option for us. Next slide. So the group health education piece. Um, I think it's great because it's an alternative to a lobby or a waiting room. Rather than the youth coming for HIV STI testing and just sitting in some room and really not getting anything out of it while they're waiting for a counselor to be available, we can provide them with uh, comprehensive sexuality education and make sure that they understand you know, risk for HIV and uh, sexually transmitted diseases. The group health education is facilitated or is at least supervised by a certified health education specialist. Typically, we limit the sessions to having about 10 to 12 youth participants. Um, so the HIV and STI prevention that we talk about, we, we do that through activities from evidence-based curricula, such as the Teen Health Project. And through the help of Jasmine, we're able to ensure that it's a safe space setting for LGBTQ youth and their allies. We also provide, which I know all of us know it's really important, especially when working with youth, we provide snacks and other incentives periodically. For example, um, we'll have a bring a buddy day. And the next, we let the youth know that the next time that we're here at the Teen Health Center, if you bring a buddy, we'll have something for you. Um, so in the past, we've given out like uh, headphones or um, cell phone chargers, that sort of thing. So if they bring somebody that's never been, then there's an incentive for them to come and to bring new people. Next slide. So these are just uh, some of the findings that we have. So in the fall of 2014, it's when the first Teen Health Center opened its door. So as of fall of 2014, there was only one site. After that fall, every like four to six months approximately, we've been opening up another site. So between fall 2014 and I believe January of this year, we went from one site to five, which is awesome. Um, but we've served more than 800 unduplicated students. We've provided over 1,500 group education sessions. Um, we've also provided about 500 HIV and STI tests, along with more than 80 pregnancy tests. Uh, our positivity rate for the um, STI testing has been about 8 to 10 percent. Our pregnancy positivity rate uh, it hangs around 5 percent. Uh, about 10,000 condoms have been distributed. Uh, it's hard to keep track of all those condoms. We do our best, but we've definitely given out uh, over 10,000. In terms of what the youth participants look like, their average age is about 16 to 17 years old. Uh, about three quarters of them identify as black or African American. Slightly more than half of them identify as male. And about 10 to 12 percent identify as non-hetero in regards to their sexual orientation. Next slide. So some of the biggest lessons learned. I can't reiterate this enough. Flexibility really is key when using a model like this. 
each of the five sites are definitely different. Um, some of them, the staff at those sites, the school staff, the full service school staff through Nayway, are really happy to have us there and they welcome us, you know, big arms and every time we come we just get so much assistance. Other times, you know, staff members maybe aren't as on board with the work that we're doing or don't think it's appropriate maybe for teens, I'm not sure, but sometimes there's resistance. So we have to be flexible and um, acknowledge that, you know, maybe this isn't something that they really would love to have at their site, but they're accepting us there. Um, but other than that, there's also, you know, there's times where we've had barriers in engaging youth. So we really always have to make sure that they know that we're there. If the youth don't hear it from a school announcement, if they don't see our signs, if somebody doesn't recruit them that day, then really they're not going to come. Um, we're left down to word of mouth from other youth to try to get them there. Some days we've had almost 50 youth that we saw in two to three hours. Other days we've only had a handful. Um, Additionally, the location of the Teen Health Center site within the context of the school campus, that uh, has at times served as a barrier. If it's a distance away from where they leave the school building, they might not see that we're there that day. They might not see our signs. So we have to be proactive in ensuring that you know when we're there. Um, a success, the success of the Teen Centers has been tied into the motivation of our staff. Like I said, our staff are all experienced in working with teens and with reproductive and sexual health services. But we constantly do remind each other that, you know, even a bad experience for a teen when they're trying to get a sexual health service such as an HIV test, a bad experience or, you know, feeling that they're being judged can deter them from ever coming back or from them telling their friends, yeah, that's a good and safe place to go if you need such services. So we really want our staff to be all about the teams, to be motivated and understand their needs. Big key also is that strong partnerships are definitely powerful. So the Department of Health provides the health services, the testing, the sexual health education, but the grant was received by the Duval County Public Schools. Without a partnership between the two of us, we probably wouldn't have the team health centers going on. Uh, the school probably wouldn't have just said, oh yeah, you can come in here and do HIV and STI testing and hand out condoms. We definitely need that partnership. On top of the Duval County Public Schools and the Department of Health, Jasmine allows us to be sure that we're being LGBTQ friendly. And the full service schools provide us with the actual structural space to run the teen health centers in. Um, of course, incentives are important. Teens love food, so that's definitely something that keeps us fun keep them coming back. And repeat visits from youth, so say you come three, four times so they never get tested, it's not necessarily a bad thing. They're still getting comprehensive education. They're still learning what their risks are. But we also found that youth that come more than one time are two and a half times more likely to get an HIV or an FTI test. And that might be due to increased comfort levels um, beyond that first visit that they feel comfortable now with the staff with getting a test on, et cetera. And next slide. So here are some of the references. Um, I'd like to note number three specifically are the guidelines that we follow for a team from a reproductive health visit. Next slide. And this is my contact information if anybody has any other questions for after the end of this webinar. Thank you so much, Samantha. So at this point, I'd like to thank all of our speakers for their thoughtful presentations, and I would like to let the listeners know that we're going to now begin our Q&A period. We have a few questions in the queue, so I will start with my first question that is for Dr. Ladon. Does CDC have any recommendations about at-home testing for adolescents? Um, okay, thanks. <clears throat> Um, so that's really a, probably a really relevant question, particularly for adolescent and young people, because um, at-home tests can particularly 
um, address the issues around access to testing and also confidentiality. So um, the CDC, I would say, recognizes the potential for home tests, especially among adolescents and youth. But um, however, we don't issue any particular guidance that's specific to home testing, and we don't do that for any population and not specific to adolescents either. Um, but although, other than that, we do recommend that only FDA-approved tests are used. And so um, I might say that if, if you're considering them, that would mean you would either need to go with um, the FDA-approved collection kit um, that's done where a, a person would um, collect a specimen and then send it to a lab for diagnosis and then call in to receive the results or the, uh, the OraQuick rapid test, um, and that the manufacturer, regardless of age, recommends that um, if you receive a positive test that you then present at a clinic, and they, they, I think they um, direct you to local services where you would get a confirmation test. So other than what applies to you know, which test to use, we don't specifically address at-home tests. Thank you. And um, for those on the line, if you want to learn more about the different types of HIV tests, whether it's the home test versus the rapid test versus the Orsure test, we do have information about that on our website, whatworksinyouthhiv.org. So this next question is for Justin Rush of NASDAQ. The question is, what do you think contributed to the high retention rate in the SMILE program? Um, so yeah, I think that, and when having a conversation with um, the individual who collected the information around the, the care model, it really seems as if it's the fact that the program is housed within St. Jude's Hospital and it's also co-managed by the health department. And many of the youth are also connected with the CTP Memphis program. So it's a combination of the concerted efforts of testing and linkage efforts and then the re-engagement of the youth via the CTP so that equals kind of like full coverage of their educational mobilization and healthcare and HIV testing needs. So it sounds like that's the combination of it being housed within St. Jude's and, and co-managed by the health department. And they really are able to tag team the, the HIV testing and linkage uh, efforts that makes it really pop. Great, thank you. So if other folks have questions, please chat them, um, and I will go to our next question. This next question is for Samantha, um, who just spoke, who's in Florida. What's the return rate when, oh, I'm sorry, wrong question. <laughs> are condoms available at the Jacksonville schools, and how are they distributed? Okay, so that's a great question, because everybody always wants to know, like, how do you get condoms in schools? How do you get them in schools? So as I mentioned earlier, the partnerships are really important. So the location of where the teen health centers are at these five high schools is actually in the full service schools building, which is owned by United Way. So these buildings are on campus, but not owned by the school district. So it's kind of more of a blurred line there. So we're able to distribute the condoms in those settings, but um, we don't distribute them within the school building. So I know that might sound a little, um, a little weird, but basically the full service school's property is distinct from the, the school district property, so we're able to distribute them there, um, but we can't do it in the school. And we distribute them every time we're there to the teen health centers. Teens just can come on in, grab what they need, and then go. Thank you, Samantha. And I think what you're pointing um, to, if we want to generalize the strategy a little bit, is that vehicle, in situations where you can't distribute on school property, property, be as close to the school as you can. Correct. Yeah, location is definitely really important. Um, and we have another question about the return rate. Um, for the HIV testing within the youth population in the Florida clinic, but I know, Samantha, that you probably don't have that data readily available, but could you speak a little more about, you, you talked about a little bit about a game plan that once you get the test, you have time to plan. Um, how are you going to tell the youth 
about when you're going to get them to return, how you're going to contact them. Is there anything else you do in terms of getting them ready to be put into care or retention or anything like that? Um, so regarding the question about the return rate with Orishore, it's a, it's a great question, but we do explain to you, when they get tested, we do tell you that we can't disclose their results over the phone. We won't do anything like that. So if they want the results, they have to come to us and get them in person. Um, when you express that they might have a real hard time getting back to us for whatever reason, maybe they usually need to take the bus. So this one day when they got tested, they you know skipped the bus and they came to us. Um, but if that seems to be a really big barrier, we make sure that the youth know that if their test positive, if their test is positive, we will try our best to um, get in touch with them if they give us good contact information when they say that we can call them. Otherwise, we will find them uh, through our contacts at the school. Um, so although all their information is private, if we do have like a positive HIV or an STI test, at every single school site we have one person dedicated to assisting us uh, get the students contact information or get them at the end of class, something like that. They don't know why we need to speak with them, but we do have somebody that is set up to um, get a hold of you if there is a positive result. In terms of the HIV testing, I can very thankfully say that we have not had a positive HIV test. We've had a positive gonorrhea and chlamydia test, of course, but not a positive HIV test. Uh, there are plans in place as to what we would do if there was a positive result, and that really just falls on health department protocol and our disease intervention specialists um, and those that are just sensitive to the needs of youth. Um, it wouldn't be, unfortunately, it wouldn't be a new experience for a lot of our DIS that have had to uh, provide a positive result, so they would follow the protocols that we typically follow at the health department. Okay, great. Thank you for that answer. So it looks like we don't have any other questions coming in at this time. And so I'd like to just tell you um, about a few things that are new with our center as we wrap up. So as you all know, um, next week on June 27th, it's National HIV testing day. And so in advance of that day, we um, have released a few new pages on our site. So right now we have over 200 resources and about 30 some, some odd uh, content pages. So the three that we, have, um, that we have available now are HIV testing, STIs, STDs, and stigma. And so on that website, you can find these three new pages. And also under our events section, you will be able to find the slides, and um, we will make that link available on our site as soon as they are available. And so the next thing is that um, I, with our first year wrapping up, I really want to thank our advisory board members who have helped us along the way, which include Jennifer Augustine from Advocates for Youth, Justin Russ from NASDAQ, who you heard today, Miranda Ward from Promising Futures, uh, Dr. Mitch Sabatini from the Rhode Island Department of Education, Monica Rodriguez, who is a consultant but the former um, Executive Director of TICAS, the Sexuality Education and Information Council of the U.S., and Mr. Timothy Kordick, who um, works at the Los Angeles Unified School District. And so this year we've had six advisory board members, but as I mentioned earlier, that we are funded by the Minority AIDS Initiative to make sure that we're reaching those most at risk for youth for HIV. So we want we have some openings on our advisory board for the second year. And so we are looking for people who have experience with um, the southern US population, people who are working with at the college or university level or just in general, people who are working with that 18 to 24 year old population, because there's a lot of resources out there. Um, for the under 18 population, but we really want to work with people who can point us to resources and have contacts with that 18 to 24 college and university population. Those working with LGBTQ populations, foster homeless youth and those who are incarcerated, as well as people who are broadly speaking, um, working on that connection between youth development and HIV prevention. 
So if you are um, interested or know anyone that are interested, please send us an email, which you'll see on the next slide. So you can email us at whatworksinyouthhiv at jsi.com. And please, um, as we close this webinar, there is an evaluation that we will um, send out, and it will appear on your screen at the close of this, uh, as this webinar. It's also being chatted to you, and we will also follow up with you by email. So the fact that we are doing this three different ways should signal to you that it's very important that we get this evaluation data. And um, I just want to thank everyone again for coming um, to the webinar. I uh, thank our speakers for really helping us think about how we can get youth into HIV testing because as we heard from Dr. Ladon, there's definitely a gap between the number of people who um, we believe are infected with HIV who are in the adolescent um, for 1324 versus those who have actually been diagnosed. So we want to close their, this gap and we know that everyone on this call has a role in um, closing that gap. So I want to thank everyone for your participation in this call. Um, please complete the evaluation. And you can find um, the slides for this presentation. They will be available in the event section of whatworksinyouthiv.org. Thank you. This call will now be ended.